So Dr. Shaw is one of the rare individuals who's agreed to do more than one grand rounds this year. And so I'll keep my introductions brief, but for those of you who weren't able to make it to his first grand rounds, um, just Dr. Shaw did his uh, undergraduate and medical training at Duke University. He, he's paid me to say the illustrious Duke University, excuse me. And uh, he's going to come, he's now an associate professor in the, uh, in the Department of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. And he's going to talk to us today about occupational lung disease. Thank you very much, Todd. Um, one of the great things about being a pulmonary doctor is you get to learn about a lot of different occupations because they because a big part of pulmonary medicine is investigating how the workplace or the environment affects the lungs. So I thought that I would kind of uh, review this um, today and we're really privileged to have Mr. and Mrs. Linwood Taylor whom I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, Mr. Taylor has um, was a, a welder for 34 years and he has a, a condition called siderosis and I'm going to have them teach us a little bit about this medical condition but even more importantly his wife will talk about the trials and tribulations of getting workers comp and social security disability um, which I think a lot of us don't know very much about. So when we see people either in a pulmonary clinic or a general medicine clinic, sometimes they'll come in with a big packet of papers and uh, they'll want to know whether their disease or condition is work-related. Um, and, and some people who smoke, certainly in pulmonary diseases, that muddies the water. Um, and you have to kind of wonder, should this person get disability? Is the problem work-related or due to something else? Uh, what is workers' compensation? So our goals today are to, to try to enlighten all of us about these issues. I have this big drain pipe here because when I see these people and they have all their paperwork, I kind of think I'm going to be sucked into a big drain and it's um, going to be a lot of work for me and something that I, I don't really relish doing and I imagine most of you feel the same way. So Mr. Taylor um, came to me in 2004. He had been a welder for 33 or 34 years and his main symptoms were coughing and shortness of breath. He'd actually been to another emergency room in December of 2004 with severe <coughs> coughing, dyspnea. Uh, I think he had low-grade fever. Um, his chest x-ray, which I'll show you a representative in a minute, um, showed these small nodules. Uh, a lung doctor in the other town, very excellent lung doctor, did a bronchoalveolar lavage. and the differential was 93% macrophages and 7% lymphocytes. Um, that's a fairly normal differential. Um, most lavages are mostly macrophages and then a few lymphocytes and very few neutrophils. The macrophages contain brown pigment and ferruginous bodies. Um, and I forget whether the the other pulmonary doctor wanted another opinion about this or whether they were starting to get into the legal issues of whether he had uh, a lung disease caused by his years of welding. Uh, but anyhow, he came to me and this was uh, not his chest x-ray. His x-ray actually, it was before the digital era. Um, so, But his x-ray looked like this. and. I think most of you can see very small, diffuse nodules in the lung. And if I showed this to a pulmonary fellow, they would say, well, this could be silicosis, which is, uh, you know, w workers in coal mines who inhale silicate can look like this. Sarcoidosis sometimes can look like this. Granulomatous lung diseases, 
Uh, these nodules are not typically miliary TB, but it, it would raise that issue. Um, histoplasmosis. So there's a, a lot of things that could cause this. This is not specific for um, arc welders, lung disease. The previous treatment he had before he came to see me was prednisone and inhaled steroid Advair, and he really had no improvement. He was still coughing, you know, and I, I'd ask him to take a deep breath, and he would really cough. It was non-productive cough. He had a pulmonary function test that essentially was normal. Um, on physical exam, again, it was coughing and some ronchi with deep breathing. We did a six-minute walk test, and he really didn't desaturate. In the pulmonary clinic, we'll have people walk continuously for six minutes at a brisk pace, and we measure how far they go. Normally, you or I would go about 1,200 feet. Um, and our O2 sat would not decrease, so we'd probably be 96% at rest and stay 96%. We use six-minute walk tests a lot to follow certain diseases, especially interstitial lung disease. It's probably, in my opinion, better than a, a static pulmonary function test. Uh, if the six-minute walk test gets worse and they desaturate, that's a bad sign. Anyhow, his six-minute walk test uh, was pretty much normal, although he, he had pretty severe dyspnea. Um, so just a couple slides on welding and what it does to the lungs. When uh, people weld, you have an arc of electricity and it creates a very high temperature. And you might be welding two pieces of metal together and then there is a wire in between that melts and it helps to make the seal and all that emits a huge amount of smoke and gas and I'm going to have Mr. Taylor tell us about that in a minute. Uh, and these are respirable particles so they're small, they're less than two microns and as probably most of you know particles that are five microns and larger get caught up in our nose and pharynx and usually are they, they can irritate our nose and pharynx, but they usually don't get in the lungs, whereas these smaller particles really get into the lungs. Um, Antononi um, has done some rodent studies where he has the rodents inhale um, various mixtures of, of welding materials, and when there's stainless steel electrodes, there's really a neutrophilic influx into the lung. As you could expect, a closed environment is bad where there's not ventilation. Many welders have a lot of cough and bronchitis and asthma-like symptoms. There's a metal fume fever, flu-like type illness with cough and dyspnea. Um, they have more bronchial infections than other people. Siderosis, which is the disease some welders get, you have iron oxide in their macrophages, and it's really not a fibrotic disease. Like asbestosis is a fibrotic disease. Oftentimes their pulmonary functions are nearly normal, as was Mr. Taylor, and there's possibly an increased risk of lung cancer in people who have welded a long time. So I'm going to have Mr. Taylor get up and just tell us a little bit about what welding was like. Um, City over near Wilson, and he was working in a big welding shop in Rocky Mount. Um, tell, tell the doctors um, just kind of what what it was like and the fumes. And your wife said you'd come home black and covered. And Lights up there, and we go uh, had 
two years before that, kind of describe like when you were deer hunting and what kind of symptoms you had. Uh, well, when me and the son would go in the morning deer hunting, walk to a sand, I would have to talk about halfway I probably would have to walk a hundred yards. And I would have to stop and rest about 10 or 15 minutes before I could go on. Next time I go, I might be fine. And coming out, it might have hit me again. And I had a call of sinus infection. And I keep it right on it to. six months before I really come down with my lungs. Uh, and I cough real, cough real bad and uh, I don't know, uh, really can't explain to you. <laughs> well, that was great. And even though he's been out of this environment now for over five years, still when I ask him to take a deep breath, he'll frequently cough and, uh, you know, climbing stairs, you know, walking very far, he still has shortness of breath. Um, thank you. So I'm going to go on a little bit more. Um, So when I saw Mr. Taylor initially, I, I felt like he obviously had severe chronic cough reactive airway disease. Probably he had this siderosis. I didn't really know much about the disease. Um, but you know, with that x-ray with all those fine nodules that I showed, there was other th things that he certainly could have, sarcoid or amyloidosis. Check video cable. Oh, okay. Okay, good. So that's still good. Um, so there's other things that could have produced this x-ray. Um, and always, sometimes when you see people, you know, you always wonder whether it's factitious. Is it somebody who's trying to get disability or workers' comp and maybe they really don't deserve it? So all those things were going through my mind initially. Um, and I think he, he had some papers and the attorney, you know, wanted me to um, answer whether this lung disease was induced by the welding and I thought there were three possible responses I could give. A, I'm not sure, I need a lung biopsy to rule out some of these other diseases. B, yes, this is siderosis caused by 30 years of uh, exposure to welding. Um, the fine nodules indicate this is siderosis. But, you know, when, you, when a doctor makes a judgment like that, it has a lot of consequences. Uh, if a person goes on disability, his income is going to be less than what his full income was before. Um, if he gets workers' compensation, and I'll talk a little bit about workers' compensation. Ms. Taylor is going to talk about that. That is a, a federally mandated program that every state has. So the state of North Carolina has workers' compensation laws. Um, P, all the businesses in North Carolina are required to pay into this system. For example, if you work at University Book Exchange downtown, the owner of that pays for each worker a certain amount of money every month into the workers' comp program. If one of the workers at UBE gets injured on the job, let's say bookshelves fall on, on them and they're injured and, and have medical expenses and lost work, then the workers' comp program pays them those expenses. Now, in turn for that, it's my understanding that because of workers' comp, you can't sue University Book Exchange for $50 million for that injury. Workers' comp kind of eliminates huge, excessive lawsuits, but it does compensate 
the person for their injury. Now, if University Book Exchange has a lot of workers injured, then the owner has to pay a lot more money per month for workers' comp insurance. So it's in the best interest of the corporate owner to protect his workers so he doesn't have to pay high workers' comp monthly fees. The last answer I could say is no, he worked there for 30 years, he didn't have this problem, he's trying to get workers' comp or disability and this is factitious. Um, I took the course of getting a lung biopsy on him so that I was certain it wasn't sarcoid or hypersensitivity pneumonitis or granulomatous lung disease because I didn't want to have him go out on disability for the rest of his life. He was a relatively young person at age 53 when really he had another lung disease. So he had a thoracoscopic lung biopsy, which was really kind of nonspecific. And when you do lung biopsies in most of these people with occupational lung disease, it's nonspecific. It doesn't say this is siderosis. But you rule out other diseases. So by doing this lung biopsy, I knew he didn't have some other granulomatous lung disease or sarcoidosis. And so this helped me conclude that his lung disease was most likely related to his work in, in welding. Now, in medicine, when we want to prove something like drug A cures disease B, we like to see three prospective randomized controlled studies to really be certain of that. In the legal system, to, uh, the, the standard is much less rigorous than what we face. A physician has to just say it is more likely than not that disease X was caused by exposure Y. So it's just greater than 50% likelihood in my mind that a, a certain disease was caused by welding in this case. So, um, you know, we're not 100% certain of hardly any disease, but because of the legal system, you only have to be 51% um, sure that something is caused. So I felt comfortable in stating that his disease was most likely caused by his exposure as a welder. Um, and before I move on, let me have Miss Taylor come up and um, tell people kind of the long experience you had of first of getting workers comp and then long term social security disability. It took him 28 months to get his disability from the state. We filed ourselves first and they denied it, so therefore we had to have an attorney. Then with the workman's comp, they never filed anything. They sent us papers and stuff to use to get his money, I mean his medicine and stuff, and they wouldn't activate it. So we went almost six years with no insurance coverage at all on him, which we pocketed our son and us and our church helped us pay for his medicine and other things that we needed. And it is a hassle to fight an attorney for a workman's comp and disability. So workman's comp is different from social security disability. Um, and so they had to fight both systems. And Ultimately, he got workers' comp, which helped pay for his medical expenses and some lost wages, and now he lives with long-term social security disability. Every paycheck you get, you'll see there's a certain amount taken out for social security, and that's for our retirement social security, and also to pay for this disability program. Um, how much does he get per month for the disability? He gets $1,650 a month. Which, which probably is less than if he were working full time as Correct. a welder. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, you know, I never totally understood what 
workers' comp and disability are, and I think I do now. Um, and hopefully, when you see paperwork, you'll understand that. Now, we as personal physicians don't decide who gets disability or who gets workers' comp. The Social Security system has doctors and boards and judges, and they, they had to go before a judge, Mr. Taylor did, and they had all the evidence from me and other doctors and a Social Security doctor, and they make the decision about whether somebody gets long-term Social Security disability. So when you are seeing a patient, you're not deciding whether he gets disability, but they use your documentation to help decide that. And it's very important that especially with occupational lung disease, that you have a really detailed history of what the worker did, when he did it, whether his symptoms were worse during the work week, got better on the weekends or on vacation. Um, and actually, when I looked at my medical record on Mr. Taylor, I was really proud, although I knew that this was part of the issue, of, how, of all the detail I went to through his work history and um, how it affected his symptoms. I'm going to move on and talk about asbestos lung disease. That's much more common and all of you are going to see that because DuPont and Kinston, which is no longer really in existence, had a lot of workers who were exposed to asbestos. Weyerhaeuser and Plymouth had a lot of workers exposed to asbestos and um, also Norfolk shipyard workers. This is the Weyerhaeuser plant in Plymouth. If you go from here to Nags Head today, you'll go through Plymouth. And as you enter Plymouth, you're going to see this smokestack. And um, I, I, over the years, have done some medical surveillance work for Weyerhaeuser. It's now called Domtar Paper Company. And they let me in there a few years ago, and I took some pictures. Years ago, Weyerhaeuser was making fine paper, like all of our computer paper. To do that, you have to get all the pine trees and the wood that are brought in there, and they basically cook this stuff under very high temperature, and it, it turns it into a liquid, and then it becomes paper. To cook this, there are boilers, and, and when this plant was built in the late 40s, Asbestos was used to insulate the boilers and all the pipes, so the plant was loaded with asbestos. And certainly in the 50s and 60s, there was no protection for the workers because the government did not outlaw asbestos until 1971. So many of these workers would be ripping the asbestos off the pipes, breathing it in with no protection, and some of them have develop asbestos lung disease. Um, I'm going to digress for just a second. This is Dr. Ernest Ferguson from Plymouth, and I actually knew him before he died about 10 or 15 years ago. He's the reason why Brody School of Medicine is here, really. Uh, you know, we all attribute it to Dr. Leo Jenkins, but This is a, a, a book which many of you have probably seen on the early history of ECU School of Medicine. The first page of this book talks about Dr. Ernest Ferguson, who had been to some medical conference on the weekend at Duke, and he was um, coming home, and he, he had been a, pr a primary physician in Plymouth, seeing all kinds of people. There was really no, it was like third world medicine in Plymouth before ECU. And um, the, I'm going to read just a couple sentences from the first chapter of this book. Dr. Leo Jenkins liked to say that the idea for a medical school at East Carolina College originated with a general practitioner from Plymouth, Dr. Ernest W. Ferguson. As Dr. Jenkins described it, Dr. Ferguson came to the president's house on 5th Street in Greenville one Sunday afternoon in the spring of 1964. He was very angry. He had just been attending a seminar at Duke University on primary health care. While in Durham, 
He had talked with some of his old classmates about the problems in getting another doctor to practice in Plymouth where he had more patients than he could treat without assistance. His friends shared with him their views about the medical situation in Eastern North Carolina. So Dr. Ferguson told Leo Jenkins, this is a horrendous problem and Dr. Jenkins had no idea of health care in Eastern North Carolina and ultimately they went on to the board of trustees of ECU and it's a long story of how they got the money from the state. But um, Dr. Ferguson, I think, is the, is the main reason why this school is here because without him, Leo Jenkins would have never known anything about the problem. So moving on to asbestos, um, I do this asbestos surveillance at Weyerhaeuser. The courts about 10 years ago mandated that Weyerhaeuser needed to follow these workers medically who had been exposed to asbestos. So every year they get a chest x-ray spirometry and a physical exam by a doctor in Plymouth. Um, the chest x-ray is read by what is called a B reader. It's Dr. Beagleman and this is kind of a certification that he has to determine whether a radiograph looks like asbestos lung disease. There are 71 patients who are followed. One of them has had lung cancer. Pleural thickening is far and away the most common finding. Nine have these reticular opacities. Some of those nine people have true asbestosis. One has a, a nodule, so that gives you kind of a flavor for the incidence of problems. Um, this is a radiograph with pleural thickening and every internist is going to see a patient with bilateral pleural thickening and diaphragm calcifications. When you see that, that's a slam dunk. That is asbestos exposure. 99.9% .9 of the time it's benign, it's not malignant and um, and assuming the patient doesn't have symptoms, you really don't have to do a CAT scan or a biopsy or other investigation. Um, you'll see pleural effusion is pretty common. As a pulmonologist, I've seen many people who come in with a pleural effusion. You tap it, it's an exudate. You have to make sure there's no infection or malignancy in there. And, um, it's kind of an exclusion diagnosis. An asbestos pleural effusion usually resolves on its own in one to three months. Um, but again, you have to make sure there's no neoplasm or other disease causing it. Uh, when you see the pleural thickening, how do you decide whether this might be just benign asbestos pleural thickening or maybe a mesothelioma? People with mesothelioma almost always have some pain. Um, they may have some weight loss, may have a lobular appearance on the radiograph, and it will change with time. So most of these people that I see have benign asbestos pleural thickening. They really have no symptoms. You do a pulmonary function test, and it's normal or near normal. Again, they do not need a CAT scan or a biopsy. But if they're developing pain, x-rays changing, then you need to biopsy the pleura, usually with a surgical biopsy because a, a cope needle doesn't give it enough tissue. So what do I tell people who have just benign pleural plaques? I tell them it's benign, it's not going to turn into malignancy. You really stress they shouldn't smoke because if you have been in asbestos and smoke, your risk of lung cancer is 70 times that of a non-smoker without asbestos exposure. If they're a non-smoker and have no symptoms, I usually have them get a chest x-ray in three years. More often if they're a smoker, there's no real fixed rule on this. This is something I do and other people may do x-rays more often than that. Um, and again, no need to do a CAT scan or a biopsy. So. All of you, if you go into primary care or internal medicine, are going to see this bilateral pleural thickening occasionally. The next disease is asbestosis, um, and this is obviously some severe, diffuse, reticular, interstitial lung disease. 
These people are very symptomatic. And I've done several depositions where the question is, does the patient have asbestosis? American Thoracic Society fortunately published clear-cut standards for a diagnosis of asbestosis. The patient has to have a reliable exposure. Usually it's 20 years before they show up. So if I breathe in asbestos today, I'm not going to have asbestos next week. It's a 15 or 20 year latency period. Um, the chest x-ray ought to have this B reading with a, a, a one to one perfusion. So you really ha have to have it read by a B reader. They have restriction on their pulmonary function test, low DLCO, and inspiratory crackles. So if a person has all of these findings, I say, yes, this is asbestosis. If they don't, um, you know, it's not asbestosis. So somebody with pleural plaques that is not asbestosis, they ordinarily get no compensation or very little compensation. But if they have these criteria for asbestosis, there's a, a financial compensation system, and they certainly deserve it because these people are short of breath walking 50 feet. Um, the last disease I'll briefly mention is mesothelioma. It encases the lung. It's a terrible disease without any good treatment for it. Um, so just in summary, asbestos pulmonary disease, pleural plaques, pleural effusion are much more common than anything else. Some people have asbestosis. A few people have mesothelioma. Out of the workers at Weyerhaeuser in Plymouth, there's only been about two or three that have had mesothelioma. Lung cancer has increased due to the combined smoking and asbestos. The last um, patient I'm going to talk about, and this will introduce the uh, disease of occupational asthma, which is pretty common that you'll see. Um, this is actually a man that I saw in a clinic I do in Plymouth a month ago. In the 60s, when he was 35 years old, he went into these grain silos, and you see them uh, sporadically around eastern North Carolina. Most of these silos have corn in them, and the farmers are putting the corn in, and it's later used for feed for animals. Well, the corn in a silo it, it ferments, and they want it to ferment because if it ferments a little bit, then it doesn't rot. And in the fermentation process, uh, nitrogen, nitrous oxide is produced. So it's really a closed-in silo with this yellow nitrous oxide gas in there. And also there's organic dust and fungi in, the, in these corn silos. Well, this worker that I saw a week or so ago in the 60s, he had to go up inside the silo and, I guess, turn it around or churn it. He said he'd go in there and he'd start coughing his head off and wheeze, so he'd come out for a few minutes, recover, and then go back in. There was no respirators, no protection, and he's wound up with severe obstructive lung disease. He was a non-smoker. And um, now, OSHA protects these workers, and they have to wear respirators when they go in silos. Um, and just like with the welders, Mr. Taylor told me that they now have protective respirators for welders. So things are much better now than they were. Um, but farm occupational lung disease from farming is really common. And probably the most common one is occupational asthma. Soybean dust is probably the biggest offender. Um, workers who are out um, harvesting soybeans and they breathe it in, I have a number of patients who have asthma induced by that. Uh, Morgan, who wrote this occupational lung disease book, says when a patient blames dust or conditions at workplace, he should be taken seriously so occupational asthma is basically asthma. So you have to diagnose asthma, which is reversible airway obstruction, inflammatory lung disease. And so you know you have appropriate pulmonary function tests and symptoms to diagnose the asthma. And then it's 
you, you have to decide whether it was brought on by the workplace or made work, worse by the workplace. In eastern North Carolina, organic dust, hog farmers, um, soybean dust, people who are in grain elevators, that's pretty common. Um, some vapors and fumes. Um, people who spray paint cars, those are closed in envi environments with toluene diisocyanate that will sensitize people to getting asthma. Occupational asthma is not the person who says when they go into a place and the perfume bothers them and they, they can't stand the perfume or the fumes, that's not asthma. Um, technically, to prove asthma in some people, you have to do a methacholine provocation test. Um, vocal cord dysfunction or spastic dysphonia is not occupational asthma. So it has to be causally related to the workplace, grain dust. Sulfur dioxide, I've seen a patient who worked at Texas Gulf Sulfur down on the Pamlico. They release they have sulfur dioxide tanks there and every now and then there'll be a, a release of that gas and people will really cough and have dyspnea and it may continue for months and months and months even if they don't have subsequent exposure. Um, occupational asthma doesn't affect every worker in the workplace, maybe only 20 percent of the workers will have the disease. It may start early on or it may start 20 years later. You know, Mr. Taylor did his welding for 30 years before he really became symptomatic. Um, Re-exposure to the agent precipitates the asthma response. And I always ask people, you know, if you're on vacation for a week or two, are you better? And then you go back to work, does it get worse? Are you better on weekends? That's a, a good question to ask and document in the chart. So to determine if asthma is work-related, a simple thing to do is have them come to your office and get spirometry at 8 in the morning, go to work, and then repeat the spirometry at 5 p.m. when they finish work. If you see a real drop in their FEV1, that's suggestive. Or another thing in the pulmonary clinic, we have peak flow meters, which we give to patients. They keep a peak flow diary where they measure their peak flow during the day and for a whole week, and that can be suggestive. They ought to have an appropriate exposure. If they smoke, that really clouds the issue. Um, sometimes we do methacholine testing. This is an example of a peak flow diary, and you can see that um, these days, the person is not working, then he goes to work, peak flow drops, and then he goes up, stays out of work for a few days, it goes back up. So when you see big drops in peak flow when they're working, that's certainly very suggestive. Rarely we'll do challenge testing where they inhale whatever the substance is, and sometimes there's a, an immediate IgE response, then they get better for a few hours, and then gradually get worse. Um, this is a late phase antibody mediated response. Uh, management of occupational asthma. You really want to keep people working. You know, you don't want people going out on disability. So frequently, if you can communicate with the employer to improve the ventilation, maybe change the site that the worker works in, uh, maybe wear a mask during certain procedures, all that'll help. You treat their asthma like you would treat anybody's asthma. And most people you can keep working, um, but sometimes they have to go out and, on disability and get workers' comp. Um, you certainly don't want somebody to continue working in a place and get progressive asthma and airway remodeling and then get fixed airway obstruction. So the role of the doctor in all these occupational diseases is to document the impairment. You know, how far can they walk, their pulmonary function. For an internist who's evaluating back pain, 
try to be precise about what they can do and what they can't do. Um, you know, the history is so important, as I said. Other people will decide disability and workers' comp, but if you have good records, that can facilitate the whole process. Um, so this just summarizes what we've talked about, and hopefully you have a better understanding of the whole workers' comp system and Social Security disability. Finished a little bit early. Any questions for me or for Mr. and Ms. Taylor? Rick? question of is examination of sputum worthwhile in, in my reading on this I didn't see where uh, that was done I guess if somebody is producing a lot of sputum it would be a reasonable thing to do most of the time Mr. Taylor was kind of a non-productive cough he didn't bring up much sputum and the black soot that people have is a combination of all these gases and fumes, um, and it's not just the, the iron dust. Uh, Adam, we'll go to you first. The, you know, you have two electrodes and it's creating this arc and you have this wire in the middle that melts down the there's different metals that are being welded and you know they have manganese and iron and copper so there's a lot of different welding types with a lot of different gases and welders weld different things some of the metals um, are more injurious than others. I don't have that on the top of my head. Um, but th there's many different types of welding and a lot of different things they weld. And um, sometimes it's hard to pinpoint what is the most injurious. This one researcher ha has welded different materials in rodent cages and then he lavages the lungs and he sees that certain um, types of welding cause more lung injury in the rodents than others, but obviously you can't do that in humans. Harry? Say so you have a patient in your office and they, and you describe at work, they have maybe a dusty environment and there's a, either a short of breath or have an asthma symptom. Who should you contact? Do they go to the health department, the county health department, or who else as far as investigating the work environment? OSHA. And, and North Carolina OSHA, there's a website. I've occasionally contacted them. And if they think it's legitimate, they'll go to the work site. They can sample the air. And um, so OSHA is, is really the investigative tool for this. And, you know, 30 years ago, I'm not sure OSHA even existed or they were pretty weak. But there's a lot more protection now. Mark? I, I'm obviously not a lawyer. I, I suspect that that if OSHA comes into a work site and the employer knows that Joe Jones called OSHA, that if the employer fired Joe Jones without reasonable cause, 
there'd be big legal problems and and a legitimate lawsuit over that. So I, I think there's real protection to calling OSHA. Also, you know, there's MSDS sheets, and any worker can ask his employer for the MSDS sheet, which tells them what the toxicity is of fumes or whatever they're working around. Um, and, and there should be no recrimination to asking for that. I think companies now, they want to avoid workers' comp payments. They want to avoid disability because it costs them in the long run. And so I think things, people are a lot more protected now than 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was a good point. Ms. Taylor said the attorney took 25% of their package. So that's a fair amount. And, you know, they were living without income for six years and no insurance. And, and I can remember giving them medicines out of the drug cabinet. And um, so, yeah, it's not something you want to go through. Thank you very much.
Yeah, I bet you miss it. I mean, imagine you'd rather be working today than being home. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I guess when I see, I think you can get a sense of, uh, you can get a sense of these folks are talking for a long time and spend a little extra time. And I think a lot of us have a, a, a quick sense of what it's going to be feeling when you get a little bit out of order. Or I have a lot of people come in, and they're good people. And I have to come in and say, you know, Mark, what would be your ideal? And you pretty much are cutting me right out of what you're doing. And that's what my goal is. And when some people, the, the good people will come in and say, if you can take your short cut for this, for this pain, and whatever it is that I'm in, away, and let me get back to what I was 